So the topic I chose was about Typhoon uh, Hyann or Yolanda. And the reason I chose that topic is because shortly after the uh, typhoon hit, I was asked to go to the Philippines as part of a medical disaster team. And I came back last week. So my presentation I put together here. Unfortunately, the photos I took, I was not able to transfer over. So these photos are not mine. But they were certainly places I was and things that I saw. So what I'm going to talk about is how disaster response uh, really is an example of cultural diplomacy. The typhoon hit the central part of the Philippines, basically the areas in red. And we don't have a pointer here. But you can see, well, we'll just leave it at the areas in red. Other parts of the country, though they had rain and storm, were basically unaffected. The good news was is that Manila, though it had rain and had water, was not dramatic, was, was really not destroyed at all. So the areas that were destroyed were in the central area, which then left the other parts of the country in a position to be able to respond and to help the parts that were most affected. In the Philippines, it's called Super Typhoon Yolanda. That is the name. Um, Haiyan is the international name. So you'll see it both ways, and that, that's the reason why. It touched ground on November 8th, and it hit the central Philippines. There were winds to 300 kilometers an hour and storm surges up to five meters. I've seen things written that said that the storm surges were up to 15 meters, but my personal belief on that is that it was a matter of misunderstanding in the media over time, making the 15 meters, which would be 15 feet, and then transferring it again to 15 meters. But that, that's just my own guess. Um, if you look at the storm, the storm was really the most, it's believed to be really one of the strongest storms ever to hit land. Up in the upper right-hand corner there, you can see um, the red bar graph compares the, um, the winds of various recent storms in the Philippines. On this chart, you can see where Manila is and see how the band of the storm um, was around Manila, or excluded Manila. Okay. Basically, what happened from the storm there were about 6,000 deaths. Again, in the media, you'll see the death numbers varying from probably about 2,000 to 10,000. I think around 6,000 is the current number, with about 2,000 people still missing. I think the expectation is, is most of them probably perished in the storm. Though as recently as last week, there were very many people that were still looking for their relatives and had not heard back from them. So I think it's, it's a little bit uncertain exactly um, where some of those 2,000 people are. After the storm, and this is what a lot of the media reported on, the international media, 60,000 people left for either Cebu or Manila. Most of them left from the Tacoban region um, or Ormoc. They left but from the Tacoban airport, which basically after the, st the airport is not as we think of an airport. It's certainly not like the Berlin airport. It's basically a big landing strip that's concrete. Um, it was covered with debris very quickly after the storm. It was, it was cleared, and that then became the primary center for, for relief efforts, both in terms of the military from, from the US, Japan, and many other countries. Planes were just taking off up and down and up and down all the time. The other thing is, is a lot of the relief agencies set up their um, operations around the airport so that the airport really became a center for the relief efforts. Before the storm, the storm, people had a lot of warning. They knew about three or four days ahead of time that the storm was coming, recognizing that in the Philippines, storms come about 20 times a year. So it was difficult for people to really understand, is this really different from the other storms? Is this really, what is this really going to be? I was talking to an expat who was on Komodis, a, a remote island, and asked him, what was the storm like for you? What did you do? He very systematically tracked the storm as best he could, looked at the geography of where his house was, which was literally on the water, realized that there was kind of a mountain that protected his house, and he stayed. Um, and he survived and, and, and was fine. The other thing to remember with typhoons is rarely is it the winds or the storm that is the killer, and that's true. Um, that was true in New Orleans in the United States um, as well. 
what happens and what kills people is the water. It's the storm surge. So before the storm, about 800,000 people evacuated. Overall, over a million houses were damaged and destroyed. Just from the time on the ground that I had, I think that's probably an underestimate. In, in the areas where I was, everything had damage. Um, about 4 million people were displaced. And they say that about 10% of the entire Philippine population was affected. And I'll, can, can you turn the, lights, the light out a little bit or not? And I'm just going to go through these. A lot of these are, are is, is there any way to, can you, can you see those pictures at all? OK. I'm just going to kind of quickly, these are urban pictures. And part of what we're going to talk about is urban versus rural. It was a totally different experience. These are, are pictures around Jacobin, the same place that, that the media, it's, it's where the media was the whole time. And it truly, the entire place was just totally decimated. You could have picked any square block and it looked like this. It wasn't as though you had to look to find a dramatic picture to take. That, this is what it was. It was gone. This is a picture, uh, this, is, this is like probably where most of the pictures have been taken. You can notice the plane in back. So basically you had this landing strip back there, this series of green roofs, served as the airport. People waited, as you can see outside here, and I have a couple other pictures there. They waited there to go into these torn down buildings, hoping to get one of the few flights from one of the three airplanes, of which there were long waiting lists. And then they would go. The other place they could go is if they were, that's if they were buying flights. If they were going on part of the evacuation routes, they would kind of go through the same place. And then there was like a football stadium Thing at the far end of the airport, and they would wait there till the next flight could come. The flight would come, they would go on the plane, and they would be off, usually either to Cebu or Manila. The, when I was there, things were extremely orderly. The first time I had transited it, it was kind of filthy, frankly, because it was wet, and there was sewage, and there was mud, and it was raining. I went back a few days later. And, and basically people said the rain was a good thing because it washed a lot of stuff away. The reason why this area was so dramatically hit was because it sort of made a funnel with the water. And this is where the primary um, storm surge was. This is a picture from the other side of the airport. You can see the control tower there. There was one, it's just one big landing strip. At times it was so congested it was a little bit it caused a little anxiety just because there was so many big planes coming in and out and so little space. They very, very quickly cleared the roads of all the debris so that you, within a couple days, you had transportation going back and forth from the airport to town. Now the transportation was the usual transportation. It was little motorcycles, um, little bicycle, jeepney kind of things, and an occasional uh, vehicle four-wheeled vehicle. Um, this is what the people's homes looked like afterwards. Large areas that looked exactly like this. One day I took a walk through there, and the thing that to me was so amazing was the spirit of the people. They were smiling. They would say hi. Um, it was truly remarkable. Okay, so what were the relief efforts? Okay, it truly was an exhibit of cultural diplomacy. There were more than 60 countries here. These are the countries that either contributed or promised a million dollars or more. And there were many other smaller countries that made additional contributions. And in the, in, in the relief efforts, at least as far as I was able to observe, everyone seemed to truly try to work together. If this country had goods that needed to be moved there, that somebody else tried to help them move it. It was truly a joint effort. A number of uh, NGOs and other organizations, we heard the other day about uh, the UNICEF activities there with the vaccination programs. I participated in, in some of the vaccination programs, which we can talk about. Emergency response has three phases, and I don't think people really realize this. The first is the response phase, and that's immediately after the disaster. And even in this situation, as dramatic as it was, 
people viewed the response phase as just being a couple of days. This is the time immediately after the disaster, you're just trying to mitigate further death and, and further real de human destruction. It's the search and rescue, it's providing food, water, and shelter. It was totally amazing to me how quickly food, water, and shelter got to even the remotest places. Within a week, the, water, the public water supply to Tacloban, which we just saw, was functional. The water company didn't have quite enough fuel, so it wasn't functional full time all of the day, but within two days they had enough fuel and it was working. Diarrhea and those kinds of diseases were not a problem. This is some of the transporting of supplies. That airport was just full of, of military planes, not all US, other countries as well, in and out, in and out unloading things, collecting things, as well as moving people in and out. This are the, 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 the people from Tacloban waiting to, to um, exit. The basic food supplies that were brought in relief efforts, depending upon where you were, we're going to talk a little bit about the rural areas there, it was primarily canned fish and rice. Some of the other supplies were rice, um, a high high caloric biscuit for the children, um, and then, then some fish and other things as well. A major problem was shelter. And the primary things that got distributed right away were food, water, and then these blue tarps. And to Cloban, the way they distributed water, because how do you distribute water in a situation like this? What they did is they had, they have collapsible plastic jugs, they distributed those, and then people could go and collect their water. Okay, so the recovery phase starts immediately after um, the, the threat to human life has subsided, and there the goal is to return to normal. It was amazing to me how quickly at least the people's sort of day-to-day -day emotional response returned to normal. When I was on commodities, there would be long lines of people waiting for their fish and their rice, but the women were laughing, and, and, and it, was, it was kind of like a normal... Um, I don't want to call it a party or a celebration because it wasn't. But, it, but, but people, people were not forlorn. They were hopeful. They were trying to work together. They were trying to get things done. And then there's the reconstruction phase. I think the reconstruction phase in this situation is probably going to be the most difficult because of the amount of really long-term problems um, the typhoon created. Okay. I'm going to talk briefly about commodities. Commodities is where I spent most of my time. The Commodities Islands are very remote. They're accessible by a ferry boat. There's about 100,000 people that live on the island scattered about in little villages of about 1,000 people or less. There's three little towns. Economically, it's one of the poorer areas of the Philippines. The, the sustainable agriculture is coconuts, corn and rice. There's fishing. The fish are exported to the neighboring uh, mainlands. There's a few small towns. Every house on that island, for all practical purposes, was damaged. Many of them were just totally leveled. Most of the houses were houses made from woven coconut leaves, sometimes on um, the ground, sometimes on a, a little wooden frame. These are just a few of the pictures here. And again, one didn't have to look far to take these pictures. You could just go down the street and just take, you know, random pictures. But still, people were trying to put things back together. There was a sense of energy of trying to make things back to as normal as they could possibly be. Okay. So the Commodities Islands, as remote as they are, were pretty amazing. I spent uh, a day with the, the mayor of Pilar, which is the most remote, remote of the remote parts. And he was, he was, was telling us with, with a sense of enthusiasm and, and, and I guess gratefulness as well, that they, in their little town, they do, they do uh, preparedness planning. And that they had just finished their preparedness exercise about three months earlier, and they had stored food. Now they thought their food would last a week, but it lasted two days, but at least they had immediate food. The day after the storm, he had the presence to take a little boat and go down to Cebu, the cap his provincial capital, and tell the government officials he needed food. They got him food the next day by boat. As he says, when people are hungry, strange things happen. 
my people were not hungry. There was true leadership there. Also on these islands, there was only one death, again, because there wasn't the storm surge. The death was actually quite tragic. It was a young woman with her child who is in one structure. During the storm, she was afraid it was going to fall over, so she, went to a, she tried to go to a neighboring building, and a, a coconut tree uh, hit her and, and killed her in, at that time. Okay, so the typhoon response on these islands, within two days of this remote rural place, he had water. Within four days, he had his own water systems back together again. The rice and fish arrive the next day, and the, the, blue, the blue tarps. Those blue tarps are going to be there for one very, very long time. That's, it's the long-term tragedy of this that's going to be a problem. Um, the water supply was back. Interestingly, the electricity is going to be a very, very difficult thing to bring back. Their electric power lines are not insulated. They're just aluminum coiled cables. Because of that, if any of them were to fall in the storm, you would have fire sparks shorting out. You'd have a big problem. So before the storm hit, they turned out the power. The power, in order to get it turned back on again, they're basically, because everything is just so gnarled up, I mean, all the power lines are down, it's just a mess. They're basically having to rewire everything. Saying six months is probably very optimistic. A few of the towns have power now. I was talking to one of my patients about having no power. I said, you know, how is this not to have power? He kind of looked at me, and this was like in the poorest of the poor villages. And he just kind of looked at me and said, you know what? I only had one light bulb. Now I have a candle. I mean, it's, it's that kind of attitude that really kept things going. Um, another thing that was of, of real concern to the mayor was that when they opened the schools about a week after the storm, they only had a few children there. And the reason was because the children were needed at home to try to put things back together again. Also, a lot of the schools were, were seriously damaged. And so he has real concerns about how the basic infrastructure is going to get back together again. The good news there is that fish was returning. After about a week, the fishermen could fish, and they could continue to sell their fish back to Ormoc, which was very different from the fishermen in Tacloban, where I so showed you first. Even up to several weeks after the storm, they could not sell their fish. The reason they couldn't sell their fish is they were still finding bodies in the water, and no one wanted to eat the fish. Um, public health kinds of things. The water on, on Komodis Islands was available very early on. Some of the areas needed electricity to get water. They didn't have electricity. Water was uh, trucked up there. It was really pretty amazing how quickly that happened. Also, the Philippines has an amazing infrastructure in that every one of these little barangays has some kind of a little health worker. And then there, there's three made clinics that have sanitation workers. The sanitation workers go out and do things like making sure that, that the wells are chlorinated and, and things like that. So they, were, they knew what to do to try to get the water safe again. Vector control was a big problem. A lot of people had, along with their light bulb, they would have a fan. Without electricity, they didn't have fans. Without fans, they had mosquitoes. Um, the pediatric health programs, which the UNICEF um, woman talked about, and they, they were real. We went from barangay to barangay to barangay vaccinating the kids for polio, measles, and then giving them a vitamin A supplement. And, and, and my job is, the nurses were giving the shots, and my job as a physician was to examine any of the children that seemed to be a little bit sick, because you have to decide if you want to vaccinate them or not. During my whole time there, I never saw one child with diarrhea. These kids just did not have the kinds of infectious diseases that you would expect after such a situation. The Philippine Department of Health screened kids for stress. On the island, they found one child that they thought had stress, and that child's problem was that his parents had been in Cebu during the storm, and he'd never heard back from them. But all in all, the resiliency was pretty amazing. Um, I'll just sort of talk quickly about this. The biggest issue is going to be the long-term problem of jobs. Coconut trees were the primary source of income on, this, on, on Pilar, and about 80% of the coconut trees are gone. It takes about five years to get more coconut trees that produce. Another issue, shorter-term agricultural issue, is that the rice had just been planted, and it was all destroyed, and so they're going to have to get that replanted before January in order to have a crop this year. So this year's crops are going to be a major issue.
there's going to be long-term economic issues. But I think this picture just sort of captures the resiliency and the hope that, that are there. And the Philippine government really worked together. Um, people were everywhere, um, and they seemed to be everywhere in a pretty organized and co coherent way. So thank you.